Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you for organizing this initiative. Um, so my name is uh, Adil Marianiv. I'm a research associate at the Center for Developmental Social Neuroscience at Reichman University, Israel. And today I'm gonna share my findings about how mother-child synchrony across development mediates and shapes the neural representation of empathy. So our very first relationship in life is the relationship between an infant and his mother. And this relationship is the basis for our future relationships and interactions in life. And through this pattern of nonverbal interaction in the beginning of gaze of affective touch, the infant is learning to recognize the emotions of himself and of others and to share them which is the basis for what we call empathy, a basic skill for maintaining social interactions later on in life. We followed mothers and infants for almost 20 years, and we quantified the mother-child synchrony. You can see it here on the y-axis uh, across development. So uh, mothers and infants were interacting naturally in infancy and then at preschool and adolescence, uh, they were talking and inter interacting in a home environment. And we quantified this synchrony score between the mother and the infant, how much the mother and the, and the child were coordinated and reciprocal and sharing uh, the, the interaction. And we can see that the interaction becomes more complex and uh, both mother and the child become better experts with interacting with each other. And so we can see that the synchrony score is increasing through adulthood. Then when the children were 18 years old, we scanned them an fMRI in an empathy paradigm. The instruction was, please put yourself in the shoes of the people that you see. How would you feel if you were in their state and then the uh, children saw uh, a context and photos of people in different situations of uh, distress of sadness and of joy uh, for instance this person just won the lottery is a joyful situation and then uh, what we see here is the empathizing brain we see in orange regions that are activated when you empathize with someone, no matter what is the emotion. So it can be sadness, joy, or, um, or distress. We can see activations uh, across the temporal lobe from the inferior parietal gyrus to the temporal pole. We can see prefrontal activations in the dorsal uh, and the ventral uh, medial prefrontal cortex. And we can see amygdala, the parietal gyrus, and the precuneus. And I was interested not only in the uh, activations during empathy, I was interested in the question, does this region change their pattern of activation as a function of the emotion? Does it matter if you empathize with someone who is sad or if you empathize with someone who is happy? And here we can see that the results are used representational similarity analysis. And uh, you can see here the comparison between each pair of emotions. And surprisingly, we see that the amygdala, the temporal pole, the insula, and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex are the sensitive regions, meaning that these regions change their pattern of activation as a response or as a function of the emotion that the person uh, that you empathize with is experiencing no matter which emotion that uh, would be. And on the other hand, we can see other regions which are part of the, what we call empathic brain or, or empathic process, but they, um, they are indifferent. They don't change the pattern of activation as a function of the emotion. So I was interested in these, um, let's call them sensitive regions. And I continued to, uh, to examine them. And I saw that uh, 
In the temporal pole and in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, uh, the more prosocial the children were, and by prosocial I mean uh, they were um, they were uh, exposed to a story, and they had to decide what they would do if they if their action would be a prosocial one. For instance, will they give back a sum of money that they, they have just found on the beach, or will they keep it to themselves? And we see here that uh, the children that uh, tend to, um, to perform more pro-social uh, decisions had um, a dissimilarity value, which is higher, meaning that the temporal pole and ventral medial prefrontal cortex were more sensitive to emotion-specific empathy. And then we saw that the uh, mean synchrony score, and here I remind you the first uh, box plot graph that uh, I showed you, of the synchrony from infancy to adulthood. So this is the mean synchrony score from infancy to adulthood. I just um, averaged it uh, across uh, development. So it predicted the sensitivity of the amygdala and the insula. So the more you were synchronized with your mother across development, the more your amygdala and insula, they were more sensitive to empathy to different emotions. And here we can see a, a, a unique mechanism of shaping these two regions. Um, and it's interesting because both the amygdala and the insula are part of what we call the parental brain. These regions are, are activated when you see or when you hear, when you respond to your own infant. And when you experience sensitive and synchronized interactions with your own mother, these regions become more sensitive in your brain and maybe uh, they prepare you to be the parent to your own children. Um, so thank you very much. I want to thank uh, Professor Ruth Feldman, my uh, supervisor, and you're welcome to scan and read the full paper. Thank you. Great. Wow, fantastic. This is great work, uh, exciting work because it answers big questions. I do, so that I can finally say something I understand because I do synchrony research similar to this. So I am first going to say how important this is because we wanna know does uh, parenting style, mother-infant relationships early on, what do they predict later on? And there's a lot of uh, common knowledge about it, but not so much data like this that says what will develop later on, what will improve, what, what is consistent. Um, so I love this work, obviously, but I'm going to ask you a devil's advocate question because I'm wondering what you think about it. Are you basically measuring, do you think the same thing in different modalities and showing that Empathy in behavior, synchronicity is empathy in brain synchronicity later on. Well, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, I no, I don't think it's it's the same thing uh, because what I measured here is the neural representation of empathy. Um, so I measured. Uh, does a region change its pattern of activation as a, as a, as a function of the emotion that you feel? Uh, but it doesn't say anything about your behavior directly. So uh, to answer that, I would have to, to perform a different experience, experiment that maybe the, the participant would, would actually do something, but then it's, a, it's complicated to do it in, in fMRI. <laughs> Um, but you know, it, it's not the same thing. Neural representation uh, is not is not similar to to behavior. I don't I don't have any uh, critiques. I'm gonna let Karina uh, do the top uh, lifting here, but it's wonderful work, Adi. It's amazing. Thank you. Really. 
No, I thought it was really interesting as well. Thank you very much. Um, I was curious. I mean, it was nice to see some plots also where you had all the data. So you're actually showing like in a lighter uh, color all the actual data points. So I was just curious. Um, this was a more like the content based question. So how did you quantify mother child synchrony? Like what was that based on? Like what was measure? What was the main measure of that? Is it motor behavior or? Um, no, we have um, a set of uh, codes that relate to the child or infant's behavior, uh, a code that relate to maternal behavior, and a set of uh, dyadic codes that quantify the, the um, dyadic uh, features of the interaction. Each one of these codes, we have over uh, more than 30 uh, different codes, each one of them is uh, quantified and synchrony is composed of uh, uh, averaging of five different code that characterize the uh, reciprocity and the um, uh, concordance between the mother and the child. Okay. And of course, there there are different schemes for uh, infants and or for uh, adolescents that. Uh, uh, are uh, appropriate to the developmental stage because uh, in infancy it's non-verbal of course and much more uh, parent-led yeah 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 cool because it, and this was during like a sort of naturalistic interaction you just told them to be in the lab and, and do something or was this at home it, it was actually a home visit we we tried to make it as comfortable for them uh, as possible so it was uh, at a home environment uh, and the interaction was uh, to the mother please play with your baby as you normally do and later on they were playing with a set of toys and in adolescence and young adulthood they were planning a fun day together uh, the mother and the child okay nice nice i can see that marilyn wants to ask something so i'm just gonna be quiet. No, no, no. If you have something, I just, I, I literally just had one comment um, aside from, wow, uh, beautiful, beautiful work. And maybe this is the, this is what we have to aim for with slow science, 20 years worth of data collection. That, that is epic. Um, the, the, the only comment uh, or advice I could give is you had one slide where you had the, the happy, sad comparison in a list of brain areas um, where you have a couple at the top, which are significant and a couple at the bottom that are less interesting to your to your uh, main idea. And this sort of came back uh, a couple talks ago where we said, you know, just be super clear binary about it. These are areas that are important. These are what we see in happy. These are what we see in sad. That's obviously the figure that you have in your beautiful paper. But for a talk, you need to somehow find a way to capture that information in a slightly different way because people don't have you know the time that we do when we look at a paper to look at the figure try and read the text um so it's it's a beautiful figure all of your figures are just like Whoa, i don't make figures like that for my papers you guys are amazing but for a talk you have to actually do the hard work and redo them because you've got a different audience a different amount of time um and you have this beautiful story to talk about the amygdala and insula so talk about it from the beginning don't give them all the other noise, you know, DLPFC, obviously important, interesting, but the, your, your story, what you're going to tell them at the end has to be there at the beginning. So a little bit of advice, but otherwise amazing. Yeah, so related to that, I did have that a similar-ish comment. So at some point you started talking also, when you talked about the neural data, about the relationship between child's pro-social behavior in relation to the brain activation. And then I was a bit like, oh, but I thought it was about the synchrony with the parent. So I think, again, for a really short talk, you might actually want to just be like, okay, it, it's scary maybe to be like, okay, I'm just literally going to throw all this other stuff out, uh, but I'm only going to focus on the one key question, because at that point I was a bit confused about where it was going or whether that was still part of the question or not so and then you had the next slide obviously that was about that but I think it's actually fine to keep it for such a short talk quite like even more simple and just focus on that one topic and um, so that was one like one of the points I wrote down is like sort of a more critical note but I think in general you did a really good job thank you okay so for thank you Adina.